where else? Oh, ah, slowly evolved to today. This is pure propaganda. What he, Miller did in his experiment, and Yuri, and everybody since, they filter out the product they produce. This is not realistic for nature. What they actually made was 85% tar, 13% carboxylic acid. Both of those are toxic to life. Now, if you make an experiment that's 98% poisonous to the other 2% you're trying to make, would you say that's a success? Actually, what he generally made was two amino acids. There are 20 necessary for life. He made basically two in a poisonous mixture. He filtered out the product. That's not realistic. What the, he made these amino acids, but they will bond with the water and the tar and the acid much quicker than they will bond with each other. Amino acids are sort of like letters of the alphabet. You know, there are 26 letters in the English alphabet. With combining those 26, you can make all kinds of words if you get them in the right order. You can also just drop letters and make a whole bunch of nonsense stuff too, you know. He made a few amino acids. It's like making a few letters of the alphabet. There are 20 amino acids required to make proteins. He just made a few of them. These amino acids are like letters. It takes a bunch of them to make paragraphs. It takes a whole bunch of them to make a book. And to make one living cell takes trillions of these amino acids in precise order. Half of what he made was right-handed, half were left-handed amino acids. This creates a real problem because the smallest proteins have about 70 to 100. Maybe there's one less, I don't know. Uh, but all are left-handed. The smallest DNA all have, and DNA and RNA all have right-handed. It's called the chirality. He made a mixture. It's not going to work. They will unbond in water much faster than they bond. And as far as anybody knows, the oceans are completely full of water. <laughs> and Brownian motion is going to drive them apart, not bring them together. The experiment was a fraud. It's a lie. It's a fake. It didn't, didn't work. Don't let them tell you they made life in the laboratory because they never came close. Somehow they get this idea, though, that all you got to do is get all the molecules together and add energy, and it'll make life. Okay, well, then let's do a science experiment. Let's put a frog in a blender and turn it on. In just a few moments, you will have frog nog. You will have all of the energy required to make a frog, all of the molecules required to make a frog in one place. Right? Now we're going to add energy. Put it on puree. <laughs> Leave it on for a million years. Nuke it, microwave it, zap it with jumper cables. I don't care what you do to it. How long will it take to reassemble the frog? <laughs> it ain't going to work, is it? No. We don't have a tree of life. They put this in the textbooks like, yes, boys and girls, humans evolved from bacteria billions of years ago. It's in all the textbooks. This is pure propaganda value. That's what it's in there for. There's no evidence for any of it. Even Mary Leakey said, those trees of life with the branches of our ancestors are a lot of nonsense. Stephen Gould said, the evolutionary trees that adorn our textbooks are not the evidence of fossils. They make this stuff up. It's imagination. This textbook says, all the many forms of life on earth today are descended from a common ancestor found in a population of primitive unicellular organisms. There's no such thing as a primitive unicellular organism. And then it says, no traces of those events remain. Yes, boys and girls, we know what happened, but there's no proof. Mm -hmm. This textbook says the humans, the birds, and the crocodiles have a common ancestor. Isn't that the impression they're trying to get across? Look, folks, everything inside that circle is pure religious speculation, not science. They might want to believe that, but that's not science. It's a lie. It's based on pure imagination. Anybody that teaches that is in trouble when they stand before God. Jesus said, if you destroy a child's faith, you're in serious trouble. Read Matthew chapter 18. Then they tell the kids, because something is smaller, it is simpler. They talk about sim simple, simple one-celled organisms. Look, a paramecium is single-celled. But it's not simple. One paramecium is more complex than the space shuttle. And you can put thousands of those into a drop of water. Smaller is not simpler. Here's a paperclip around a microchip. This ant is holding a microchip in his mouth. That microchip can process every letter of the Bible 200 times per second. Smaller is more complex. I'll show you. Let's compare the brain of a honeybee to the NASA Cray computer, the YMPC-90, at one time the world's fastest computer. The Cray computer is huge. 
The brain of the honeybee is tiny. The Cray computer did six billion calculations per second. They estimate the honeybee's brain does a thousand billion per second. The Cray computer uses many megawatts. The honeybee uses 10 microwatts, extremely efficient. The honeybee can fly a million miles on one gallon of honey. Let me see you make a machine that gets a million miles per gallon. The Cray cost $48 million. The honeybee's brain is pretty cheap. You splat them on your windshield all the time. <laughs> Many people scramble when the Cray breaks down. The honeybee heals itself. The Cray weighed 2,300 pounds. The honeybee's brain doesn't weigh too much. Let's see, what can we conclude? The supercomputer was huge, slow, inefficient. You had to babysit the dumb thing. But everybody knows it had to be designed. Right? There's nobody with half a brain that'll tell you the Cray came from an explosion in an electronics factory. <laughs> it was designed, okay? And yet they turn right around and think the honeybee evolved. And the brain of a human is a lot more complex than a honeybee. A lot more complex. Did you know your brain is capable of a memory capacity of storing all the information of the British Library? And it has a computational speed in bits per second equivalent to the entire national telephone system. Just in three pounds of gray matter. It's estimated there are more connections in your brain than there are electrical connections in the world. How many times have two wires been put together and crimped or soldered or clamped together somehow? Wire nutted in the world? Your brain probably has more than that in the number of connections. Just one brain. I asked a professor one time, I said, Sir, do you believe your brain is nothing but three pounds of chemicals that got together by chance over billions of years? He said, Yes, I do. I said, Then how can you trust your thoughts and the reasoning processes? <laughs> Maybe you got a chemical in there backwards. <laughs> he did, by the way. <laughs> Anybody that believes they come from a rock has several of them in there backwards, in my opinion. Then they tell them, well, DNA proves evolution. Every, just about every debate I do, they'll say, DNA proves evolution. Oh, let's talk about this. This textbook says we have evidence from molecular biology, talking about the DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid. This book says Darwin speculate, speculated that all forms of life are related. This speculation has been verified because of DNA sequences. This is a lie. There's nothing about DNA that has helped verify evolution. The DNA is the most complicated molecule in the universe. One DNA strand is about six or seven feet long. Average person in this room has 50 trillion cells in their body. Each of those contains 46 DNA strands, except for the gametes, they got 23. If you took all the DNA out of your body, it would fill about two tablespoons. But if you unwound it and stretched it out, this really complex, tight molecule would stretch out and you could tie them all together, and one person's DNA would stretch from Earth to the moon and back five million round trips out of two tablespoons. It's got the most complicated code ever in the history of the world. If you typed out the code found in your DNA, when you got done typing, you'd have enough books to fill Grand Canyon 40 times. Does anybody work with computers at all? Let me see you get 40 Grand Canyons full of books, condense it to software, CD-ROM, PK-ZIP, I don't care what you use, SciQuest. When you're all done, though, it has to fit into two tablespoons. <laughs> My Heavenly Father did it. He's pretty smart, ain't he? David said, I will praise thee, for I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. He didn't even have a microscope, and he could figure it out. You know, from conception to birth, the baby adds 15,000 cells per minute to its body each one more complex than a space shuttle. How would you like to be in charge of supplying materials for a factory that's producing 15,000 space shuttles a minute? Some of you ladies are thinking, I did, man, that's hard. <laughs> Sometimes in the middle of the night, they want pickles down there for something. What do you want a pickle for? I don't know, but go get one. <laughs> Must be building something that needs part of a pickle. Who knows, you know? You know, the probability of one DNA arranging itself by chance has been calculated to be 1 in 10 to the 119,000th power. 
That's a big number when you consider the entire visible universe is 10 to the 28th inches in diameter. Big number. DNA does not prove evolution. DNA only shows how complex life is. You know, penicillin only has two chromosomes. Fruit flies have eight. I put together some critters and said, you know, I think I know how evolution really happened. Penicillin was first and it evolved to a fruit fly. And then it evolved to a tomato or a house fly. They're twins, you know, they both have 12 chromosomes. Very hard to tell the difference between those two. And then slowly over millions of years, they got some more chromosomes and became a pea. And then it evolved to a bee. Now here you can see the similarity. P, B, very similar. <laughs> and then very slowly it evolved to lettuce. And over millions of years, finally, triplets were born. Did you know the possum, the redwood tree, and the kidney bean all have 22 chromosomes? The average scientist cannot tell them apart. <laughs> Let's see, possum, redwood tree, kidney bean. Yeah, let me see. Tree, got it. Possum, oh, we got it, folks. There we go. And then slowly, over millions of years, we evolved to a human. Here we have 46. And if we can just get two more, we're going to be a tobacco plant. <laughs> Sometimes I'll get on the elevator and I'll say, man, you're evolving. You're way ahead of me. <laughs> and of course, dogs and chickens are twins. Everybody knows that. They both have 78 chromosomes. And someday we might get enough chromosomes to be a carp. <laughs> and it probably won't happen in my lifetime, but maybe we'll evolve far enough that someday in star date 349572, we can be a fern. <laughs> I was in a church one time, and this lady came to me afterwards and said, Mr. Hoven, I'm fern. <laughs> I shook hands with that hand right there. I'll never wash it again. They tell the kids to think critically. Boys and girls, there are 20 kinds of amino acids. That's true. They make up proteins. Explain how this fact supports the idea that all life shares a common ancestor. No, that fact supports the idea that all life has a common designer. I bet you could go to the library and find all the books in the library contain the same 26 basic letters. Don't they? Yep, that proves everything evolved from Morse code. No, that proves that's the, that's the code with which you write English. And the 20 amino acids is the code with which you write proteins, okay? And God did it that way, I think, so that we can eat something other than ourself. See, the brown cow can eat the green grass and get the white milk, and I can drink and get the blonde hair. <laughs> if God didn't make it that way, we're the same 20 same amino acids, then we couldn't digest other things. Think about it. They tell the kids that the human and the chimpanzee are related. The human and the orangutan are 96% similar. That proves a common ancestor 15 million years ago. Well, this is baloney. Barney Maddox, the leading, leading genome researcher, he said, the genetic difference between human and his nearest relative, the chimpanzee, is at least 1.6%. That doesn't sound like much, but calculated out, that's a gap of 48 million nucleotides, and a change of only three nucleotides is fatal to an organ animal. There is no possibility of change. Kids, when they tell you that you have proof for evolution because the human and the chimpanzee are similar DNA, they're confused or they're lying to you. Actually, they've now discovered the difference is much greater. It's now 95% similarity instead of 98.6. We've got tons of material on this on our website. The similarity between humans and chimps is much greater than they thought. I mean, the difference between the humans and chimps is much greater than they thought. Um, similar structures nearly always have similar plans like DNA in this case. Similar bridges nearly always have similar blueprints. This hardly constitutes evidence that one sired the other or that they were erected by tornadoes. <laughs> so what if we're similar to humans? You know, people have a pretty good understanding of how cars work. I've had 124 cars since I've been driving. Never had a new one. Always get a clunker and fix it up, you know. My daddy taught us boys how to work on cars. I rebuilt the motors, the transmissions, the wobbleator shafts, the muffler bearings, the high-speed Knuton valves. I know how cars work pretty well. But understanding how a car works does not explain how it originated. Big difference. Just because you know the operation has nothing to do with the origination. Suppose your son turns 16, like my kids did years ago. Your son comes up one day and says, hey, Dad, I got my driver's license. Wow, son, let me see that thing. 
Ooh-wee, that's a lousy picture. It is a good likeness, though. He said, hey, Dad, uh, can I borrow the car? Well, son, listen, your mom and I knew this day was coming. We've been praying about this. We don't think you're ready for the whole car, son. The car is a complex machine. Did you know there are 3,000 bolts required to hold a car together and one nut can scatter it all over the highway? <laughs> the car is so complex, we decided we're going to let you slowly evolve into the car. This year, we're going to give you 10%. Next year, maybe a little more. Question, what good is 10% of a car? That's what you put in a junkyard, isn't it? How many things have to be right on a car to make it work? Like many, many thousands of things? How many things have to be wrong to make it stop working? Any one of thousands of things. Take a needle, stick it through two spark plug wires, trim it off, wrap up the rubber. They'll never find that one. Pull the distributor cap, take a pencil, rub it around, put it back. That's a tough one to find. When somebody's getting married, pull out the coil wire, stick a doorbell wire in there, shove it back, take the doorbell wire through the firewall, and weave it through the fabric of the front seat. <laughs> They're getting ready to go on their honeymoon, you know, hit that, bam, ooh, wow. <laughs> Don't get me started, we can go for hours, I like working on cars. <laughs> Folks, complex things require a designer. And yet they tell the kids that humans and chimpanzees are similar. There are thousands of differences. But even if there are some similarities, so what? If you think the percentage of similarity proves something, let me show you the research I've been doing. I've discovered that clouds are 100% water. Watermelons are 97%. Only 3% difference. That proves watermelons evolved from clouds. And I discovered jellyfish are 98% water. And so are snow cones. <laughs> that proves how they evolved. Mm -hmm. Then they tell the kids fossils prove evolution. This textbook says fossils provide evidence of evolution. This is a lie. No fossil counts as evidence for evolution. But the textbook here says evolution is a fact. The fossil record provides some of the strongest evidence that species evolved over time. There is no fossil record. You don't look back in the fossil record. You look at fossils. You put your interpretation on them, okay? They don't have a date with them in a card that says this one was, you know, made 47 million years ago. There is no such thing as a fossil record. How do we fall for such a dumb idea? But the textbooks are always saying fossils can contribute to the understanding of evolution. Darwin said, if my theory be true, numberless and immediate fossils must have existed. Boy, there must be a bunch of them out there. I agree, Charlie, there ought to be a whole bunch. This book says, since Darwin, many links have been found. Well, they're dreaming. David Ropp, who has a huge fossil collection, American Museum of Natural History, I believe, or Field Museum in Chicago, I forget which one he works at, I think it's New York. He said, in the years after Darwin, his advocates hoped to find predictable progressions, you know, missing links. In general, these have not been found. Yet the optimism has died hard and some pure fantasy has crept into textbooks. <gasps> fantasy in the textbooks? You gotta be kidding. Oh no. Evolution is based on fantasy. We could spend hours talking about there are no missing links. There just aren't, folks. These quotes are all on our website about how evolution is not supported by fossils. If you find a fossil in the dirt, all you know is it died. You can't prove it had any kids. And you sure can't prove it had different kids. And why would you think a bone from the dirt can do something animals today can't do? Hey, they say we evolved from an ape-like ancestor. Okay, apes are still having babies. Let's, let's do it again. I want to see it this time. We don't observe any evolution. Luther Sunderland wrote to major evolutionists all over and said, hey, where's the evidence for evolution? I want to see it. They all wrote back and said, we don't have it. Somebody else has it. Colin Patterson has the access to the largest fossil collection in the world, British Museum, Natural History. Patterson wrote a book about evolution. So Luther read the book and said, hey, I read your book, Mr. Patterson, but you didn't show us any missing links. Where are they? Patterson said, I fully agree with your comments on the lack of evolutionary transitions in my book. If I knew of any, fossil or living, I would certainly have included them. 
I will lay it on the line. There is not one such fossil. See, folks, there's not a missing link. The whole chain is missing. So they got a new theory now to explain why they're missing. Stephen Gould said the absence of fossil evidence is a nagging problem for evolution. He knows there's no evidence for evolution. So he's got a new theory. He kind of brought up Goldschmidt's old theory that said maybe the first bird hatched from a reptile egg. Do what? He says, yeah, you know, maybe evolution happened so quickly that there's no evidence. Oh, well, that's good, you know. We don't have any proof, so that proves it. <laughs> Try that one in a court of law. See how far you get. They tell the kids to think critically. Boys and girls, the fossil record shows that an organism evolved through many small changes over time. That's a lie, by the way. Which theory best describes organism's evolution? Gradualism or punctuated equilibria? How do you think it happened, boys and girls? Was it slow changes like Darwin said, or was it jumps like Stephen Gould said? In their mind, there's only two choices. Evolution happened slowly or evolution happened quickly. They do not seem to be capable of thinking outside the box. It didn't happen at all. God created the different kinds. I debated Pigliucci at University of Tennessee, Knoxville. Doc, I debated him twice. I don't know if he'd do it again. I'd be glad to, by the way, Doc. If you get ready, you get brave enough, let me know. Uh, I said, Dr. Pigliucci, you have studied and taught courses on the evolution of plants for 10 years. You received and spent $650,000 in grant money to study the evolution for plants. What is the best evidence you know of for evolution? I asked him that in the debate. He said, the evolution of whales. <laughs> Just exactly what kind of plant is a whale anyway, hmm? <laughs> He told me the hippo is evidence for evolution because it's in the process of adapting to an aquatic way of life. It likes the water, so that's proof for evolution. He said the flying squirrel is evidence because it has half a wing. He gets tax dollars to teach. See, every evolutionist I've talked to thinks that the evidence is in somebody else's field. It's like a shell game. You ever seen those shell games, you know, they put the pea down there and try to get you mixed up? Where does the pea? The geologist thinks that the biologist has the evidence. Pigliucci is a botanist. He thinks that, you know, the anthropologist or somebody else has the evidence. They're all spreading the blame. The only problem is there's no pea under any of them. There is no evidence for evolution. None. You tell the kids, we've got evidence from the horse evolution. This is a bunch of baloney. They arranged a bunch of animals in a fictitious order. It's been proven wrong 50 years ago. They don't tell the kids that the so-called ancient horse had 18 pairs of ribs, the next one had 15, the next one had 19, then back to 18. These are not even the same animal. It's a pure imagination arrangement of these creatures. They're teaching this in textbooks all over the world. There's quite a variety of horses today, folks. Big ones and little ones right now. But back in 1950, G.G. Simpson, who believed in evolution, said this evolution of the horse family was unintentionally falsified. The evolution of the horse was all wrong. Over 50 years ago, it's proven wrong. It never happened in nature. Why do they keep putting it in the books? They say this example of the horse evolution has not held up under close examination. Othniel Marsh made up this whole idea in 1874. He wanted to provide evidence for Darwin's theory. He picked animals from all over the world and put them in order he thought they would look good. It's imagination. Modern horses have been found in the same layers and lower than the so-called ancient horse. The ancient horse is not a horse at all. It's a hyracotherum. It's like the hyrax, still alive in Turkey and East Africa today. The ribs, toes, and teeth are different on these animals. In South America, the fossils go backwards, the wrong way. They don't talk about that. They're never found in the order presented. The whole thing is imagination. But it still is taught in the books to help give the kids evidence for evolution. The Tulsa Zoo finally took down their display after Dan Hicks wrote letters. Here's the letters right here. He wrote letters to the Tulsa Zoo and said, Why do you still have the evolution of the horse on display? And they wrote back and said, we don't have the funding to remove it. <laughs> Come read the letters. Dan went and got a bid at a sign shop. Here's the bid right here. They said, we will put up a sign that says, this, evolution, this display is not correct. 
and we'll take it down as soon as we get enough money. 62 bucks for the sign. So Dan went and said, hey, here's the quote, fellas. I'll pay the 62 bucks. When would you like the sign delivered? Nothing happened. They said, we've got to take this to the board. Well, the board got bored because they never did anything. Finally, he collected 2,000 signatures and said, get this display out of our zoo. When it made the evening news that the Tulsa Zoo was lying to the kids coming through, the display was gone the next day. <laughs> but I just found out recently, they put it back up. What's a zoo doing teaching evolution anyway? See, the evolutionists are pushing their religion at every tax-funded opportunity they can get. Peabody Museum still has the horse evolution on display. I stood there by that display as hundreds of kids came through. Stood there for quite a while. School group after school group after school group came through. Was never told this was proven wrong 50 years ago. You go get the textbooks used in your county schools or your city schools. It's still in there, folks. It's not true. That page ought to be torn out of the book. Just because you can arrange animals in order doesn't prove a thing. Even if you find them buried in a certain order, that doesn't prove a thing. If I get buried on top of a hamster, does that prove he's my grandpa? <laughs> I've been doing a lot of research on the evolution of the fork. I've pieced together fragmentary evidence for years. I believe after intensive research, the knife evolved first and then slowly evolved to the spoon. Took millions of years, you know, great geological pressure, squeezed it, <coughs> dished it out, widened it up a little bit. And then slowly, erosion cut grooves into the end and turned it into the short tine fork. And then very slowly, over millions of years, the grooves got longer and wider. I knew I had the right order, but I felt like I had a missing link, particularly between spoons and forks. You see, spoons are rounded and no grooves. Forks are squared and grooved. That's two jumps in one. Even punctuated equilibrium can't do that. So I knew I had a missing link here, folks, but I couldn't find it. Till one day I'm flying an airplane on U.S. Air, 30,000 feet off the ground, and the stewardess walked down the aisle and handed me the missing link. I don't think she knew what she had. <laughs> but my trained scientific eye picked it up. I said, this is it. Later that day I went to get some chicken for lunch and found another one. There they are, folks, the missing links. So the evolution of silverware is becoming very complete. <laughs> I have found a lot of evidence since then. I've been gathering data on this for a long time. I even found a few mutants along the way. <laughs> Didn't quite make it for some reason. You know, it was very interesting though. As soon as people found out I was doing research on the evolution of the fork, everybody wanted to become famous. They sent me all their data from all over the country. Even some lies got sent to me, folks. I mean, some people just, they just want to be famous. This one is an obvious fork head on a spoon handle. <laughs> it didn't get by me, though. This is a cutthroat business. This fossil business is dangerous, you know. You got to watch them. But I caught it right away. That didn't, it's not in my museum. The rest of them are, though. Even found that environmental pressures can cause all sorts of colors to arise over millions of years. Now, look, you can arrange letters in order and try to prove something if you want. You can turn a cat to a cot to a dot to a dog making one letter change at a time. If you play around for a while, you can turn yourself into a fool. <laughs> Doesn't take long either. Now they tell the kids dinosaurs turn to birds. Yeah. The Bible says the birds are made on day five, right? <laughs> Reptiles made on day six. Evolution has it backwards. Everything about the evolution theory is backwards to the Bible. And why some Christians try to compromise the two, I don't know. But they don't blend together. The scientist says, dinosaurs alive as birds. Scientist says, oh, wow, scientist says, it must be true. Wow, scientist says, you know, bow down, everybody. <laughs> this is absurd, okay? 1999, USA Today announced, missing link of birds is discovered. National Geographic, missing link, breaking news. We got it, folks. A huge article on how dinosaurs turn to birds. A couple of months later, uh, oops, fellas, we got lied to. Somebody in China made the fossil. It's a fake. We could spend hours talking about this, the dinosaur to bird. All those fossils coming out of China are real suspect. Those guys make, you know, $3 a year if they work real hard. 
What if you work two years and make one fossil you can sell to the Smithsonian for four million? You and your whole family are set for life. <laughs> and somebody over here is dumb enough to buy it. These guys say this bird evolution is silly. They say birds are the descendants of dinosaurs. In case you don't know, there are a few differences between a dinosaur and a bird. You don't just put a few feathers on them and say, come on, man, give it a try. It won't hurt too bad. <laughs> you see, birds have feathers. They have two legs and two wings. Reptiles have four perfectly good legs. If he's going to evolve to a bird, somewhere along the line, his front legs are going to be half wing and half leg, which means now he can't fly and he can't walk. He's got a problem. Who's going to feed him during this transitional stage? Hmm? They say Archaeopteryx is evidence of evolution. Alan Fiducia said, Paleontologists have tried to turn Archaeopteryx into an earthbound feathered dinosaur, but it's not. It's a bird, a perching bird. And no amount of paleo babble is going to change that. Archaeopteryx means ancient wing. They'll say, hey, see, he's got claws on his wings. Yep, I see that. They'll say, see, that proves it used to be a dinosaur. No, it does not. Twelve birds today have claws on their wings. The ostrich does, the Hawatson does, the Turaco, the ibis, the swan. It's not proof it used to be a dinosaur. They're going to say, he's got teeth in his beak. That proves it used to be a dinosaur. Well, now, slow down. Very few birds, Archaeopteryx and Hesperornis, the only two I know of with teeth. But, oh, the hummingbird also has teeth. Some hummingbirds do. But going from teeth to no teeth is losing, not gaining. I mean, some, some birds have teeth. Most don't. Some reptiles have teeth. Some don't. Some fish have teeth. Some don't. Some of you have teeth. Some don't. Okay? <laughs> There's the hummingbird with little bitty teeth in his beak right there. 48 teeth in the Andes Mountains. Not proof for evolution. Uh, the, the Archaeopteryx might even be a fake. That's what uh, several scientists have said. I don't know. It doesn't matter. It's not a missing link. They say bird feathers evolved from the same scales that protected the dinosaurs so well. This is silly. Bird feathers are incredibly complex. Now, feathers and scales are both made of the same protein. It's called keratin. I understand. But that's where the similarity stops. Battleships and forks are both made out of the same metal. That proves they all evolved from a tin can. <laughs> feathers and scales are extremely different. There's plenty of evidence about that. Birds have a different lung system than reptiles have. Birds have different heart than reptiles have. By the way, how can Archaeopteryx be a missing link when fully formed birds were already present? This one shows a 130 million year old crow. No, I disagree with 130 million year old stuff, but if birds are there before dinosaurs went extinct, we got a real problem here. Here's a 140 million year old bird, 142 million year old bird. There are plenty of other re reasons to refute the dinosaur-bird connection, said Alan Fiducia. How do you derive birds from a er heavy, earthbound, bipedal reptile that has a deep body, heavy balancing tail, and four shortened forelimbs? Biophysically, it's impossible. Here's quite a few problems with the bird theory. They have lungs are different. Their modern birds are already in layers lower than dinosaurs. The scales attach to the body differently than the feathers do. Birds have a four-chambered heart. Most reptiles have three. Birds lay a different type of egg than reptiles. There are just thousands of differences. There is no fossil evidence of how reptiles change to birds. That is such a silly idea. And Satan is laughing at those folks who believe in it. Satan thinks up the dumbest ideas, and he's got, oh, wow, cool idea. <laughs> yeah, dinosaurs turned to birds. Wow, that's cool. He's laughing at you for believing that. Uh, who's right, and what do we do? Richard Dawkins said, it's absolutely safe to say if you meet someone who claims not to believe in evolution, that person is ignorant, stupid, or insane, or wicked. He's open-minded, isn't he? Jesus said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. You don't have to lay your brain at the door when you go study God's Word. You just bring it along. Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Look, the most reasonable thing is to believe God created this world. That is extremely reasonable. It's logical and intelligent to believe in a creator and in a young earth creation. I debated Ken Miller on the radio once. He wrote this book. He writes, he's a professor of biology at, uh, in Rhode Island at Brown University. 
He said, evolution is controversial in certain circles. And some people wonder why a biologist insists on teaching it. The answer is simple. Evolution is the most powerful statement ever made about living things. No, evolution is the most silly statement ever made about living things. Had to be designed. Evolution is not a fact. It doesn't even qualify as a theory. It's a not even a hypothesis. It's a metaphysical research program. It's not testable science, Karl Popper said. Julian Huxley, Thomas Huxley's grandson, said, I suppose the reason why we leapt at the or origin of species was the idea of God interfered with our sexual mores. Oh, now we're getting to the truth. Some people don't want God telling them what to do. That's the bottom line. Professor Ruse said, evolution is promulgated by its practitioners as more than mere science. Evolution is promulgated as an ideology, a secular religion. He said, I am an ardent evolutionist and an ex-Christian. But I must admit that this, and this one complaint, and Mr. Gish is one of many to make it, the literalists are absolutely right. Evolution is a religion. This was true of evolution in the beginning, and it's true of evolution today. Arthur Keith said, evolution is unproved and unprovable. We believe it because the only alternative is special creation, and that is unthinkable.